Okay. <laughs> this is DIY creative creativity and open source. This is Chloe, Cameron, Sarah, and moderated by Melissa. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. It is DIY creativity and open source, and here are the slides. Yay. Um, so I wanted to do this panel because um, there are a lot of awesome projects, uh, especially in Portland where I'm from and I hear about a lot of things. So downstairs in the Hacker Lounge right now, we have Jacob's 3D printer and we're printing out, uh, this is a mess up badge, of course, uh, for the citizen badges and we're doing it with a 3D printer right now. Um, I was down in the Hacker Lounge yesterday, I was talking with Ward Cunningham, who invented the wiki, not about wikis though, and he was telling me about um, a Perl script that he writes for his Christmas lights that he does every year, and he changes it every single day. He asks his family uh, what they want for their lights, and he has a new thing every single day. Um, and it does di different colors, different light ups, it does things. Um, and that's all awesome. Like, I hear about really cool things, but for this panel and for these particular speakers, I did it because. They are not only using open source, um, they're doing it creatively, or creatively, and they're also um, doing it with a bit of a social justice aspect in mind. They're trying to do change. Um, and so uh, this is one of Chloe's projects, and that's kind of why I have us uh, arranged this way, because Chloe is first. Um, this is uh, something that she did, if you can see uh, this figure right here. Um, she used it for the, or the University of Manitoba used this image for one of their microsatellites. Do you want to talk a little bit? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so uh, the image itself is a water bear or tardigrade, um, which is an extremophile, which um, uh, I geek out on all things critters, um, especially the creepy crawlies. And so I just did, uh, the, there was the life project uh, that was going up that the uh, Planetary Society was doing, and I just kind of did, like, fan art. I was like, yeah, water bears going in space! And, um, you know, I just put it in the comments so anyone could use it, and I got contacted by uh, the the students, these students uh, from the University of Manitoba who said they were sending up a microsatellite with some extremophiles in it, um, and that they wanted to use the image and could they use, you know, change some of the, the patches because obviously Manitoba's in Canada and I had, you know, a American flag on the shoulder and they, you know, and I explained to them, you can do anything you want with the image, it's in the comments, it's yours, go ahead, you don't even have to ask for permission. Um, so they did and um, they printed out this little guy and, uh, and sent him up into space and uh, everything went really well and uh, they made patches and the whole thing and sent me a little care package and it was really fun uh, and it was just something that I did out of love and it came back tenfold um, and it just, I don't know, things like that just, just warms my cockles. <laughs> Uh, I'm still in this back. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to specifically talk uh, about Chloe because she's using open source design tools. And we hear a lot about code, we hear a lot about developers, um, we don't hear a lot about design. And she's using all open source versions. And so I was going, if you want to, yeah. you can talk a little bit about that, just what um, things you use. Uh, yeah, so uh, pretty much these three programs are what I use every single day of my life. As far as I know, I'm the only a professional working freelance artist who uses exclusively open source software and runs a Linux machine. Um, uh, My Paint is a great sketch program. Uh, I kind of do all of the brainstorming and everything in that. Um, Inkscape, of course, um, you know, you can do your vector files and raster and everything with that. And then GIMP is Photoshop ish. Um, uh, and I use that yeah, way better. Yeah, it's it's not it's not trying to replace uh, actual photo things. It's actually working with digital files, so it's better in some ways, lots of ways, most ways. Uh, <laughs> and I have mm -hmm. one more with you, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> we also uh, she also does a lot of work that is social and political. And this is I checked it. It was okay with the co-chairs of the conference that I used this image, by the way. Um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I feel strongly about a lot of different things, and uh, I, I tried to communicate. This last year, I contributed over 300 pieces of uh, different art to the commons. I try to make anything that's for myself or things that I enjoy um, to put them in the commons, uh, and I am, yeah. 
I don't I don't like to say it's political because I kind of don't care about politics, but cultural, I do care about. I care about culture deeply. Um, so there's uh, things like this. I very strongly, you know, don't believe in the gender binary, and uh, I love middle fingers. I have a lot of art that involves people flipping off. I did. I, yeah. I don't, it didn't, yeah. I know. I noticed when I was sending that, I was like, wow, I really like flipping the bird. <laughs> okay. Um. All right, so uh, these are some of the things I did with Chloe, uh, and now we're going to talk with Cameron. Uh, so Cameron, oh man, maybe she should explain some of the stuff she does. So um, <laughs> she has been, uh, this was specifically, um, the image that you're seeing right now is uh, a stage name that she used for a dark bot event. Uh, would you like to talk about DJ? Sure. Um, DJ Vlad Pantry was, um, I, I really wanted to do, um, uh, and I'm still working on this project, I want to do a half DJ set, half drag set, because I think that uh, I always liked doing drag king stuff in college, but... Um, I find that it's, you know, singing or lip syncing is one thing, uh, but I think doing performance is a lot more interesting. And so um, I'm still working on trying to figure out the best setup to do both drag and actual music performance at the same time. And, you know, uh, electronic music is very popular in, um, in queer dance clubs, so it seems like the right fit. Um, for this performance, I used NanoLoop, which is sadly not open source. Um, my previous projects in involved using Pure Data and Audacity and uh, a Meeblip, which is open hardware uh, beepy thing. It makes bleeps. <laughs> and also makes bloops. <laughs> oh, sorry. And uh, one of the other things she does, and this is all like not day job stuff. This is all on the side. Um, this is her Arduino cult induction course that she taught at Free Geek, and that's with Suspect Devices. If you want to talk about that, yeah. So, um, so I've been kind of mentored for I guess a couple of years. Um, well, probably three years by uh, Donald Delmar Davis, who's been trying to, um, he, he and I have talked a lot about how there's like such a gender disparity in open hardware and it's been, it's been really annoying. And, uh, because he thought I had kind of potential to sort of teach, he was like, well, why don't you try teaching in class? And I did. And it's very hard to teach, but I'm getting, I'm slowly getting better at it. Uh, I'm more confident about it every time, but I do, uh, it's been actually hard to get a good ratio in, in the Arduino cult induction. Um, but the more I learn about actually teaching hardware and actually teaching the Arduino, the more I realize how time intensive it is. And, um, and I'm really excited about the hackerspace that I'm starting because I, it means that I can actually work more hands-on with people who are, um, who are not normally in hardware to help them do um, interesting electronic stuff. Um, I myself am actually... <laughs> Um, I was uh, a student in the first, one of the first Arduino cult inductions, and I was like really interested in doing things, but I got really discouraged. And then uh, Don encouraged me to work uh, a little bit more and push myself harder, and I did. I, I've I've come a long way, and I've taught myself a lot, but. And so now I, I want to give people, uh, especially women, the opportunities that I didn't have, and push them in the ways that I wasn't pushed. Um, but by you know by somebody who understands them a little bit more, <laughs> just a tad. <laughs> so um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to find a new venue for that. And we should be having an Arduino cult induction soon because um, Suspect Devices is not a company that makes money. We lose money all the time. And so when we charge money for our classes, it's because we're still paying back our initial investment. So uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're aiming to make uh, $170 a month. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it's my goal for the company is to make 170 a month, so. <laughs> okay. Um, now we're going to talk with Sarah because this is one of, one of many projects she does, which is Garden Geek. And um, I was kind of going uh, off of Scud's keynote a bit from uh, two days ago where it's doing everything yourself and uh, some of the tools that she's used for her own garden, um, some of the hardware. So if you can share a little bit about that. 
Um, so I try to bring all of my interesting open source and hardware hackiness into my garden. So one of the things I love to learn is to like learn from my garden and learn about all the science behind it. But um, I get bored sometimes of all of like the daily tasks that I have to do in my garden, like, you know, watered every day. So I've done, you know, uh, talks at previous OS Bridges and other conference about uh, my Arduino uh, automatic watering system and some of the weather stuff I like to do. And basically, I think that the, the intersection of where technology meets the real world is a very interesting place to be. Um, so I, I do some Arduino hacking. Um, I also take a lot of pictures and so I use a uh, dark table as my photo editing to edit my raw photos and it works fairly well. Um, so I like photography, I like gardening. Um, for my day job I'm a Linux kernel hacker and I've been in, uh, trying to get more involved into getting more women into the Linux kernel and so I've been doing the FOSS outreach program for women and we got seven Linux kernel uh, interns that are, are going to be interns for, for three months. And so it's very exciting. Yeah. Okay, good, because I didn't have a slide for that one. <laughs> so I was going to, um, so you're doing more outreach. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that project? Because I heard sure. you talk about it at Code and Explosion. It was great. Um, so the, the FOSS Outreach Program for Women is a way to mentor women in open source projects. There's several different projects involved. You can get involved as a mentor or as an intern. Um, the program lasts for three months and you get the interns get paid uh, $5,000 to work on open source. Um, and it's a, all about improving gender diversity and also uh, gender queer and gender fluid people can apply as well. So it's, it's getting more diversity that way too. Uh, for the Linux kernel, we had an awesome, awesome turnout. We expected like maybe one or two applicants. We got 41 applicants. Uh, and to put it in perspective, we wanted to have these applicants do Linux kernel patches. Everyone knows Linux kernel patches are like the hardest to get in ever. Um, so we made a giant tutorial, we had lots of good mentors, and the applicants ended up submitting over 300 patches in 13 days. And 144 of them got accepted into the Linux kernel. Cool. Yeah, so it's an intense, it's an awesome project, and I'm really, really excited about where it's going. Um, now, we got through a little bit of their backgrounds. Um, I was going, I. In the course of kind of preparing for this, I asked everyone uh, just a little bit about their background, what got them into open source. So if you don't mind, if we go through and say a little bit about what got you into it. Um, and then after that, we can talk about um, maybe an anecdote of one thing you've experienced in it where you came across a hardship, either at the beginning or throughout. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, like a number of people, uh, I was first introduced to open source um, by someone that I was dating, uh, and it, you know that's just how it goes sometimes. Um, but kind of independently of that, at the exact same time, I got more into open culture through Nina Paley and Sita Sings the Blues. With if anyone here isn't familiar, Google it, watch it tell all your friends about it, it's the best thing ever, but uh, Nina Paley is a huge, she's amazing and she is just like the pioneer of copy left and getting art out there and making sure that everything is open and available and free and she is just radical and fierce and wonderful. Um, and it made me change my perspective on uh, how I was doing business when I was getting started because there's that um, fuck you pay me mentality in graphic design um, which you, you need to have. People always want to undercut and underpay and underappreciate and devalue art um, and so it's, it's really good in a business sense to whoa, <laughs> to, to go out there and get what you want, but um, culturally that's not at all what I'm about and it doesn't feel good at the end of the day um, when all I'm doing is stressing. And so um, kind of meshing the fact that I was getting started and you know, pinching pennies and using open source software and then saying like, no, actually, you know what, I'm not going to work up to, you know, using Adobe Suites. I'm going to stick with this and I'm going to, I'm going to grow along with these technologies and uh, I'm going to be committed to my own values. 
Yeah, I, well, bef so I, I have to thank my math teacher um, because she got me out of keyboarding class and made me take um, computer science um, in high school. And so that was, I was the, the youngest person in the class at 15. And um, one of my classmates had told me about this thing called Linux. And I was like, whoa, what is that? Will it run on my computer? And he was like, sure, because you have a 486. And I was like, whoa. Um, uh, this was in 1999. And um, just to make sure. Um, but uh, but and I, I didn't want to use Linux because it didn't have internationalization support. And at that time, I was um, uh, in my free time as a high school student, I was translating um, lyrics for a website uh, from uh, Japanese to English. And so uh, then um, when I went to college, I was in the, the Apple user group there. And I realized, wait, I'm broke. I can't afford like all the fancy stuff that you can do. So I can either pirate things or I can do like, I can like, there's this open source stuff and open source for the Mac was kind of really wonky. Um, I remember trying the first, like one of the like Ubuntu five or something like ridiculous like that. Um, those were my first forays. And then, um, uh, and then the person that I was that I was dating introduced me to um, Python. I was like, I don't like Python. I'm going to do Ruby, and uh, <laughs> it's very very contentious. Um, and so now I'm a professional um, Ruby on Rails developer. Um, so I but there's this strange dark force constantly trying to get me to do Python, um, and, and I I'm not really sure if I've had any. Uh, I guess any hurdles other than I think there's um, the attitude has been so interesting um, in Texas the open source scene is not uh, is nowhere near this kind of like there's people um, uh, open source in Texas is kind of a dirty word because it's like oh, there's so many Microsoft shops and there's not like I think things have changed but when I was younger it was really kind of weird. So it was really exciting to actually be able to move to Oregon and get paid to write, you know, in Ruby, or I, I would have even been happy to write in PHP because I didn't want to get stuck doing .NET. And I, and that was, you know, that was a, a major thing. Um, so I, I got started in uh, Linux because uh, Jamie, who's in the back, uh, said, oh, no, you don't want to Telnet into the CS servers to compile your code. You could just, you know, dual boot your laptop and, and go, you know, compile your C code for your classes there. And I was like, uh, okay, will my games work on it? And he's like, we'll try them. <laughs> they didn't actually work, but Linux was okay, and so I stuck with it. And uh, later on, I had a professor that was really into open source Spartan SE, and he introduced me to the Linux kernel development community and dragged me along to some, some dinners. And uh, he got me involved in an open source Linux kernel project, and I presented at it at OSCON. And so some of the people I had networked with at those Linux kernel dinners said, oh, Sarah, hmm, since she's graduating soon, shouldn't we, you know, get her a job? And so basically I got my job at Intel doing open source kernel stuff because I had a good network and I did projects. And so I'm really grateful for the mentorship and the network that I got. And so I want to pass that on with some of the mentorship stuff that I'm doing as well. Um, as for hurdles, um, I haven't really faced that many hurdles. There's been some random trolley people on uh, different Linux kernel mailing lists, but I found some good allies that, you know, basically jump in on it and be like, no, you're being dumb. Don't do that. Um, so I think that, that having good male allies is very important. Okay. Um. I was going to check time, sorry. <laughs> it's a freckle to ice cream. <laughs> exactly, exactly. OK, perfect, thank you. Um, next. Uh, I was going to talk about how I met you people, maybe? <laughs> Do you <even> remember? <laughs> a little bit. Um, OK, uh, what got me into uh, creativity and open source was I'm a data journalist, and that isn't all that creative, but uh, I started doing websites a long time ago, and I 
learned all this design stuff, which is why um, I was interested in you. Uh, I've been involved with Open Source Bridge for a whole lot of years now. Uh, and one thing that I tried to get at the second Open Source Bridge was anything and anyone to come together and talk about open source design. Uh, I couldn't have, like, this was before, um, this was maybe the first year of WordCamp in town, too. And so I couldn't get anyone to talk about uh, just JavaScript-y kind of things. Uh, everyone was only about uh, PHP or just other other languages, and they didn't want to talk about like the new CSSs that were coming out and stuff like that. Um, so I tried to get groups and I tried to get meetups, and um, I heard you talk at Barcamp actually, <laughs> and that is kind of how I got introduced to you. Um, so I got involved with that with Cameron. Oh wow, <laughs> <laughs> we we started talking about um, food culture. I think yeah. at a bar camp five years ago. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I've known you five years now. <laughs> and uh, with Sarah. Sarah, I actually um, found out about your work with the aerospace uh, yes. program at PSU. Can I, can I talk? Can I get you to talk? About okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll talk about rockets. <laughs> uh, so so the, one of the other things I did in, in college uh, was I was involved with the Portland State Aerospace Society, which is a completely open source, open hardware uh, rocket that's 14 feet foot high and we're going to do a launch at the end of the month hopefully fingers crossed uh, so if you're interested talk to me or Jamie afterwards but the rocket group was actually uh, part of the the open source work that I did and it was my first introduction to uh, USB which is part of the why I reason why I'm working on Linux kernel USB support right now um, but it's really, really awesome, and we're working on roll control for the rocket, so actually controlling the rocket. So the goal is to get a nano satellite into space, completely open source from the ground up. Can I do a segue from rockets into Comic Rocket? Oh. Am I allowed? Am I allowed? <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, I'm looking at my notes for anecdotes. I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, I'm going to switch to Cameron, and we're going to talk uh, a little tiny bit about one of the perils of open source. And that is going to be um, your project that you did, and you have to explain it better than me. Um, so we're going to talk about the maple bacon for a second. Can you do that? Yes, I can, I can explain this. So um, so as, as uh, one of the people in Suspect Devices, uh, we were given a contract to work on a medical refrigerator that would have the ability to call home. Um, the Arduino is kind of underpowered to do a lot of like Wi-Fi, um, Ethernet, and if you want to do all of those things or have those as options at any time, that's it's just too small. So we looked into this uh, group um, in Boston called Leaf Labs, and so they were working on the platform called the Maple, which is uh, an open source microcontroller uh, based on uh, the ARM thing. Um, so it, those are a little beefier microcontrollers that are way faster than the Arduino, but they're still small and they're super cheap, like um, $3 a chip. And that's that's pretty good because the, the Arduino is actually like still t between two and three a chip. Um, so that was exciting. Um, so I helped do part of the call home part where uh, I actually... So part of our business philosophy, backing up a little bit, part of our business philosophy at Suspect Devices is that, that we don't like to do business, like we don't like to buy stuff from China. We like to buy stuff that's made in the United States because we want to support um, all of the, the businesses in the United States as much as possible, especially, you know, businesses around us like um, Sunstone, um, yeah, Sunstone, uh, they do, they did a lot of our quick turn stuff at the beginning. And so um, we could only get the maple bacon in China, but be, or the maple platform in China, but uh, Leaf Labs is open source, so we forked their files on GitHub, and I changed the design such that it could be, uh, it had a beefier power regulator because it kind of, it blows up if you give it too much current, and it was at, uh, it was kind of bad, so I made it big, and then, because um, <laughs> you kind of need it for Wi-Fi, and then, um, 
<laughs> oh, good, good. That was in your notes. Um, and so, uh, so uh, it also needed to be single sided because we have a twenty dollar hot plate in the garage. This is part of our our working experience: is how to do things really cheap. Um, so we have a twenty dollar hot plate with a a thermometer that we got at uh, Harbor Freight, and we cook the maple bacon's on this thing, and uh, we still have kind of a bad failure rate. But uh, um, there are shots. I've been wanting to get a shot of actually, because uh, it's named after Deck Farms Maple Bacon. So I want a shot of the two of them someday um, cooking together. But that might be really gross. Sorry. So, uh, so I made it one-sided so it could be easily made on a hot plate. Um, uh, recently, um, Don likes to go on eBay and buy things. I don't know why. And they just, you know, I don't know. I, I don't understand. So, so he was like looking for, for stuff. I don't know what he was looking for. And he found somebody, uh, now there, there, there's a whole thing in China where they actually will find stuff on GitHub that's hardware. They they download the files and make it in China and sell it on eBay. That's a thing. Um, you now they, they people were finding um, maple clones and maple mini clones, which is what mine is based off of. Um, and and but I didn't expect to see somebody on eBay cloning my fork <laughs> physically. And not only that, but they actually made some interesting um, changes to the design, which I'm still going through. I had to I had to put it on the back burner, but um, uh, they they made some interesting design changes. But they didn't say who it was from. On the other ones. They will say, oh, this is a Maple Mini, and this is, it's from, like, and they'll point to the repository, or they'll point somewhere else, or they'll say the name. With mine, they were like, this is based on a reference design from the Maple Mini. And I was just like, if you're going to rip me off, at least point back to me. So, but I was thoroughly congratulated when I told people on the open source hardware list that, like, you know, I am now important because somebody <laughs> cared enough to clone and build my design and sell it back and I actually have two of them <laughs> so I've bought I bought my own design back but that was okay because I didn't have to build it so it kind of worked out but it was it's still still weird I don't even know but I actually I call or I didn't call it the seller I, I emailed the seller and the seller actually returned the files that he changed back to me. So that was really exciting. I'm a little bit scared to actually touch the files too much because I don't know if there's a virus, but <laughs> I mean, sometimes I worry about that. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to see um, what uh, what the changes are. Um, it is a risk, but it's, a, it's kind of a fun risk. Okay. <laughs> um. What else should I ask you people about? <laughs> yeah, should we go to questions? Is that all right? Does anyone have questions? <laughs> we can do a song. Ask me about gardening. Ask me about gardening. Ask me about art. Yes. Well, no, I think you Okay. Do we need? My mic is great. I'm not sure what the heck. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Sarah if your gardening Arduino project is documented online. If that's uh, it's, it's on GitHub, cool. Because I'd, I'd really love to check that out. I can talk a little bit more about the different garden projects. Um, so first of all, there's a website. It's a wiki uh, that's for. Uh, people doing gardener or agricultural or urban farming sorts of things. And it's basically a list of all the different hardware projects that are out there that are open source that you could use. Anything from like automating your, yeah, gar gardengeek.org. Um, and it's like automate anything from automating your chicken coop to open the doors at, at evening and close it on them uh, to, to like, open source weather control, you know, I'd like someone to make that, that'd be fun. Um, yes, and, any, and anything from like garden planning, like I wrote a little C program that takes a CSV file of all of the things I want to plant and it spits out an iCal so I could just drop it in to my Google Calendar. And eventually I want to do like, you know, more, ta you know, add it to a task tool, that sort of thing. Am I running around with the mic? Oh, I'm not that far away. I just wanted to ask Chloe what she thought of the Fedora Design Suite. 
Um, I haven't played with it too. Oh. Try for the recording. <laughs> um, you know, I haven't played with it too much, um, but I've heard a lot of good things from other people who um, have played around with it a lot more. I am such a set in my ways kind of a person. I still like am using GIMP, you know, uh, from. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I know, but I'm still like I'm just saying like I'm not even using the latest uh, installation of GIMP. Like I like I'm one of those people that I'm like this is the thing that works for me. No change ever. <laughs> Um, and, and learning new things is, bleh. <laughs> but, um, I did play around with it a little and, um, it was, uh, fairly intuitive, I found, so I liked that about it, but, yeah, sorry, not too much. Anyway. Anybody else? Oh, and she also designed the new, uh, oh, yeah. Women Who Hack. Yeah, I did the, I did the My Little Pony thing, yeah. She did the My Little Pony with the soldering <laughs> as the unicorn <laughs> horn. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Questions? Opening up? Or else I get to rack my brain and think of more questions for them. Anybody? All right. Oh, I guess I could. I didn't, I didn't do the uh, hardships thing. There is, um, like, a lot of people ask uh, specifically about the fact that uh, I... It's it's pretty much always if anyone's doing any design something or whatever they say you must be proficient in Adobe and must use Mac blah 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 and so um, and because I'm freelance and I'm contracting with different people all the time uh, there are many times that I just say yeah I totally totally proficient I know Adobe back, like the back of my hand and then I just do whatever I'm gonna do in my machine in my programs and they never know they never check they don't care <laughs> they have the files in they, Adobe. No, um, usually they don't even care. Like, uh, you know, if I send them an SVG, like, they're like, eh, it works. Yeah, you know, as long as, like, you can check it and it, like, opens up and does its thing and, and whatever. I mean, you can, um, very occasionally, uh, I'll throw something in just to, to, to make it into, you know, whatever the AI did. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> whatever. But, uh, usually they don't even, um, and usually they want PNGs. You know, I mean, they don't even, most of the time, yeah, most of the time people don't even have any clue what they actually want because someone, they just do the thing that someone says is the thing they need. Um, and they just want to limit people out. They want to say, you know, we don't, we don't want 13 years going, yeah, totally, I'm going to design your website <laughs> <laughs> using MS Paint, <laughs> which would be awesome. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it would be Homestuck. <laughs> it would be Homestuck, right? <laughs> <laughs> That works. All right. Um, I didn't talk about myself, so I was going to talk about myself. Yeah, talk about yourself. Yes. Who are you? <laughs> um, oh, man. Okay, so I I work with this guy who's in the front right here named Ed Barassi um, on a bunch of journalism projects. Uh, so I use open data because we're talking about open source. I use open data, and we scrape that, and we put it in SVG files and uh, we're turning some of that data and we're using um, open street maps and we are graphing it and mapping it all out. Um, we're also using, gosh, we're using Leaflet with the, we're using WordPress, yes. Um, and I got into design because I worked at a newspaper. Oh, those old, old, old things. <laughs> On paper, paper. Because uh, I learned um, Illustrator. Oh, yeah. And then I learned Quark. This was, I'm not kidding, this is junior high. I learned Illustrator, and then Quark was high school, uh, and unfortunately college, too. Uh, and then InDesign, and then I went into uh, Scribus. So do you have experience with Scribus? I was going to ask that. No. See, so I do uh, desktop publishing, which is a whole other beast. Um, and I have to go back and forth because so many other people want me to use their version of uh, the Adobe Suite still, and I hate it with a passion. And I'm trying to do um, my newest projects, which are going to be um, online magazines. Um, and I'm trying to have them be completely, completely, completely designed open source for every single step of it. Um, and that means I am really hoping Free Geek does a for real Scribus course. I'm going to talk to some people because one of our core organizers uh, is a teacher at Free Geek. Um, and I, I took one actually on um, Inkscape there a few months ago so that I could get better with my logo design for one of my projects I'm doing. Um, do you have questions for me? 
Yeah. Should I do that? Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, so what, what if, what challenges have you faced shifting from, um, from normal, like Adobe land? Normal? Wait, wait, hold on. Normal. From well, okay. From, from proprietary, right. like crazy place where nobody even thinks that there's a, I mean, so what is, I've never even heard of Scribe this. I'm kind of excited all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about it. <laughs> we're getting it here. We're yeah. getting, we're getting it, uh, no, questions no. from the audience. Okay. Um, Oh God, so Scribus is an open source version of InDesign and I have played it with it and it is its its own beast, I suppose. Um, and some things are more intuitive. Like I, I don't quite know how to talk like terminology. Yeah. Can you explain terminology stuff with like how you've dealt with Photoshop? I don't know, I wanna, I wanna pass the mic basically. Um, <laughs> It's really, it's really fun because you can save it the same way. You can uh, have PDFs the same way. All of that is just the same. It's um, when there are more people giving suggestions. It's really, really awesome, and I can actually submit stuff and say, "Hey, I want this button to do this," or "Can we add this element?" And they'll actually listen to you. And I love that part because I don't know how to actually do the change the software itself part. Um, I'm still on the design side, people, instead of developer side. I'm learning, though. Um, oh, gosh. Yeah, um, well, uh, for, for terminology, I mean, uh, it, you know, just using something, because I'm, I'm the same way. Like, I'm a user. I don't code and, yeah. and, or anything like that. So uh, for me, going into it fresh, um, but it was completely intuitive because it's just things where you try something and it would work. Like, it's just, you know, you're like, well, that seems like that should this. And then you're like, it does this. Yeah, yay, this is. Yeah, um, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of um, something because GIMP is not supposed to be open source Photoshop. That's not what it is. Um, and that, but people will use it like open source Photoshop. Um, and people will get mad when they're used to Photoshop and they say, why doesn't it do the thing like the Photoshop does? Um, one thing that I noticed with Inkscape was it was so much more intuitive. If so I wanted, much more. if I wanted to do like, polygon kind of stuff. It was so much easier. Yeah, it, Inkscape is really, um, it, it's really intuitive. There's tons of support for it. Uh, it's really, like, actually fun to learn. Yeah, the tutorials for all these things. That's, like, almost everything I learned. Like, my career is based on the knowledge of 13-year-olds with cameras, like, on YouTube. That's, like, almost everything I learned. There's also a really good book. I forget what it is. It's, uh, uh, who, which press it came out through, but uh, Donna Benjamin, who's one of the people who does a lot of Inkscape stuff, uh, wrote a part of this book, so it's worth checking out. It's an Inkscape book. Oh, um, I gotta say, I really, I've been, I kind of switched to Inkscape recently. Oh my god, their, their uh, bitmap tracing tool is Amazing. So, awesome. Awesome. It's so freaking awesome. It's so awesome! Oh my god, it's like, cause you know, I, yeah, oh my god, they're really, cause, okay, cause I couldn't, I, I didn't, I, I didn't. So, so baby, can I explain this? Yes. Oh, so yeah. basically, <laughs> yeah. basically the, 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 uh, the bitmap <laughs> tracing tool is like, I did a sketch and now I've scanned it and now I want to turn it into vector art. And so basically what it does is it looks at your sketch and it finds all the little points where the lines curve and then it makes it into an actual vectored line. And so it's really awesome for doing that. Yeah, and you can uh, alter it all different ways so you can have it look exactly like your image or you can smooth it out a whole lot um, so that it's like a, a smaller file and uh, you can play with it endlessly. It's, yeah, it, it's fantastic. There's And there's like a little pushy aroundy tool, which, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I guess I'm looking for a tool like that because I don't know how to use those graphical tools, I guess. And then so I work with other people in other departments or something uh, that want some graphical diagrams of how some complicated process works. And what I do is kind of sketch it out on a whiteboard, take a picture of that. Oh, I can actually speak to that because um, yeah. So I, I 
I've done this recently um, for for work. Actually, I, I needed to make uh, both a flow diagram and uh, some UI mockups, which we didn't use either of those things. But um, so there's now like a little tool that will connect. Um, if I don't know if you're familiar with um, this program, um, OmniGraffle, that makes like diagrammy charty things. And so the, the Inkscape now has a thing that if you make if you make rectangles or circles or whatever, it finds the radius and it connects them together. I'm still not quite sure how to make it do exactly what I want, but um, I'm sure if I actually had bothered to Google it instead of just playing around at work, uh, but it seemed to, I did a diagram. <laughs> it's possible. Oh, 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 and I was going to um, ask you two both about open typography. Do you want to talk about that? Because I use a lot of fonts. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Graphviz is also an interesting open source tool to make graphs. It can make giant graphs, too, if you want them. Uh, one time, the so the Greg Cage wanted to have a graph of all of the signed off buys in the Linux kernel. And so he had a 30 or 40 foot thing that was generated by Graphviz, and good luck getting a proprietary tool to do that. Oh, um, really quick, um, Graphviz also, uh, there's bindings for most languages, yeah. so like, um, I've, like, there's a thing called Railroady for Rails, and it actually generates, um, Graphviz diagrams, so just look at, look for bindings for your favorite language. Um, yeah, as for uh, typography, uh, resources or doing your own, I'm, you can actually use Inkscape to, to make your own fonts, and, yeah. and um, that's really fun. I have my handwriting as a font. Um, the, there's uh, really good resources out there. Also, the Squirrel fonts, I want to say. Font Squirrel. Font yeah, Font Squirrel <laughs> um, is, is a really good resource for them, um, and then it has the different, uh, you know, like wh whether it's just attribution or whether you're allowed to do anything, change fonts, blah, 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 and it has it all laid out there. And you can get them free, and it's great. Yeah, I'm not copying to how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fonts I've downloaded. Know, right? uh, <laughs> all free. I've yeah, all checked. Yeah, yeah. They're they're all they're all open. Uh, <laughs> Cameron, did you want to talk about it? Yeah, um, I guess really quickly, I know that there's a thing in Ubuntu that I used once upon a time to actually um, uh, make fonts that wasn't Inkscape, but I don't remember the name of it because uh, I used it in a VM and it crashed. <laughs> um, there, Font Forge! <laughs> yes! Um, I'm really hoping someday it'll get less buggy. Um, I also attempted to write like... Um, uh, a font browsing thing a long time ago to learn um, Ruby Cocoa and Objective C, uh, which is open source, but I kind of stopped doing the project, so that doesn't really yeah. exist. So you could uh, basically the text. Latech. Oh, oh, LaTeX. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So, oh. Talk about LaTeX. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Before you do that, though. Oh, wait. No, you should do that. And I wanted to add. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so in uh, in college, we had to write a math paper. Like we had to read an article and, and do like the the math behind the article in this nice format. And everyone else was like using Word and stuff. And I was like, we should do this in the LaTeX. And it was like the most beautiful paper ever. Absolute A. It can do all the integral symbols. It can do all the nice math. I really like LaTeX a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I wish I had found um, LaTeX and actually a uh, uh, ZLaTeX, uh, KyLaTeX. Anyway, there's like a crazy. Uh, uh, no, no, no. There's a there's there's one that's uh, like XE. Uh, yeah. yeah um, anyway, that one, the the one that I can't say the name of, um, uh, has um, Unicode support, and I actually came into um, like uh, LaTeX from a different angle, which is that uh, I did linguistics in college, and had I known that was around, it would have made my life so much easier um, because there's a nice font called Gentium, um, which has is just beautiful, but it also has um, support for all of the the IPA diacritics and. So so it means that you can actually do true transcription, um, and it looks just so pretty. Oh man! <laughs> okay, and I think we have well, any more questions because we're almost out of time. Anybody? Please. Ooh, there is a <laughs> there's a proposal for a font uh, unconference talk tomorrow. Okay. Yes. Um, I can see what time it is in New Zealand and see if Brom Patoyo can join us. <laughs>
because I've been trying to get him on Skype for a few days now. Um, and so I think I think we're done. We have two minutes. Two minutes. Anyone have anybody want to know? Final, final, <laughs> final stuff. Um, so I specifically asked uh, these women. Um, if you guys have been to some of the talks, or especially the keynote this morning, um, it was addressing uh, the ratio of women in tech, specifically, um, or and then specifically women in open source. And so I actually wanted to have um, a panel. I actually thought of you three um, before I even like <laughs> realized we were women. Yeah. I'm sorry, I kind of did that. I, I'm one of those people who didn't actually see gender there for a second. Um, and then and then I thought about it and was like, oh wait, um, the stat that everyone has been kind of saying that I still want updated because it's odd. I'm, I'm a journalist and I, I question stats, but the stat is 1.5% to 3% um, of open source is women. And I kind of wanted to say that there are some really awesome women who are in tech and who are in open source. And we're kind of nerds about it too. Um, if you can tell. <laughs> uh, I can talk about mapping and wikis. Oh my God, I am in, I'm on Wikipedia as a, an editor. Like, tile yeah, I can talk about tile mill because that's the talk that's going against us right now, actually. I have a spy in there who's going to give me notes. Um, and I'm on Portland Wiki, and like, we all use these things all the time. So, thank you everyone for your time. Yeah, so.